Hey guys, got some brand new merch. Uh, if you want to buy it, then Coolio, it's in the description. If you don't, uh, enjoy the JoJo. For it, didn't you fool? Thunder Cross Split Attack! <laughs> JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is a manga series created and illustrated by Hirohiko Araki, and people online will not shut up about it. I should know, I'm one of those people. I mean, you're probably already familiar with it too. You clicked on this video, or maybe you misclicked or YouTube autoplayed. Gee, if that's the case, then this is awkward. I'm just gonna pretend that you're a JoJo fan like me anyway. And if you're not and you still wanna watch this video, then who oh boy, are you in for a journey? Hey, you like trivia? Fun Fun fact, JoJo has a lot of that, and I don't really see many people talking about it online. It's a series that's been running since the late 80s. You would think that cool information about it would be covered in droves on YouTube, but that really hasn't been the case. And when I say this, I'm talking about videos dedicated to tidbits and fun facts, not just bringing it up in passing. The closest thing I can think of with any sort of notoriety at all is that one Did You Know Gaming video, and that's only like seven minutes. I can't discuss the intricacies of stuff like Kakyoin laying an egg in the span of seven minutes. For the longest time, I've been trying to give myself an excuse to talk about this sort of stuff in a video, but I didn't have one for so long. That was until this iceberg stuff became a thing. You know, these things, like the one that sunk the Titanic. Except instead of killing people, it gives you cool fun facts. I'm a big fan of this topic. Being a turn on the phrase tip of the iceberg, these images are meant to showcase information about a subject in a descending order from the most well-known details to the more mysterious and relatively unknown ones. Basically, the top of the iceberg is the super simple baby stuff, and the bottom of the iceberg is the much more obscure and interesting section with deep lore that only the most hardcore of fans will be familiar with. These ice Iceberg memes have been popping up more and more as of late, with many focusing on games like Super Mario 64 and Minecrafta. Though in actuality, this format has been used for a lot of different subject matter, and not just games. And while at first it was used as a form of creepypasta in its own way, it's also led to some great collections of cool facts and trivia that I've never heard before. Every time I see a YouTuber cover one of these, I end up learning some cool stuff about content that I'm a huge fan of. So today, I will play the role of one of those YouTubers as we take a look at the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Iceberg. I discovered the original image I was planning on dissecting via Twitter. Created by a user named Morgan, this image catalogs a lot of cool stuff that I was super excited to sit down and talk about. Though over time, my ambitions grew much, much larger in scale. I, I, I like JoJo and I want, I, I like, I like JoJo. I, I enjoy JoJo. Instead of just focusing on Morgan's work, I decided to create a sort of ultimate iceberg by fusing Morgan's with various others I had found online, notably taking a lot of extra subject matter from this iceberg that was posted to Reddit by user Cream Fortress 2 Um, uh, excellent name, my guy. In addition, I even went ahead and added some of my own subjects to the list that I've never heard talked about on YouTube before. Basically, I have a lot of ground to cover and I physically cannot stop my Myself from adding even more content to this iceberg on top of what I already need to talk about. So yeah, I'm leaving no stones unturned. I love talking about the funny man posing show and you cannot stop me. I want to give a massive shout out to the awesome people moderating the Jojo wiki for helping make this video possible. Without Jojo's bizarre encyclopedia, a lot of research for this project would be non-existent. So thanks a lot guys. If you want to check out the wiki after watching this video, I'll have a link to it in the description below to check it out. I highly suggest it. There's a lot of really cool documentation on there if you're interested. Just be sure that if you're googling the website, you don't accidentally go on the wrong one tied to the hosting service fandom. That's their older version and a lot of the info on that is missing or out of date. Also, another huge shout out to Nazumi VA, aka Marcy. Writing this script was exhausting and I never would have completed any of this without her help. Marcy and I practically double teamed this massive list of trivia together and and I'm incredibly proud of what we accomplished. If you like this video whatsoever, you need to check out her channel. I'll have it linked in the description along with everything else. She's incredibly talented and makes banger video essays, so watch them or perish. Anyway, with introductions over with, let's jam. 
My name is Salty, otherwise known as Derek. You can call me either, it doesn't really matter. And this is the ultimate JoJo Iceberg. Quick warning, spoilers for all of JoJo ahead. And I mean all of JoJo. I'll try to label anything not covered in the anime yet with timestamps to skip, but just try to be careful or go and read the manga and come back. Might take you a bit, but you can do it. I believe in you. Reddit user. Starting off at the first level, we have Reddit user. This section of the iceberg is by far the shortest, containing the bare basics of JoJo knowledge. These are less kind of fun facts and more just like basic meme knowledge. Regardless, I'm going to try to explain these to the best of my ability anyway, because this is the life that I've apparently made for myself. Kono Dioda. Okay, so this is the sort of thing I was just talking about. Literally, all you have to do to get this is watch the first episode of the anime. Although something interesting here is its impact on internet meme culture, which would then go on to affect the viewer base of the show. Kono Dioda is a line that was popularized on the internet after the initial airing of the current JoJo's anime by David Production in 2012. This phrase is exclaimed by the character Dio in the first episode of the show after stealing Arena's first kiss, which she had been saving for Jonathan Joestar. Many English speakers translate this line as It was me, Dio! Or as It was with me! Dio! in reference to the kiss. But interestingly, a more literal translation of the dialogue would actually be, It is this, Dio! Translations aside, the phrase, It was me, Dio, is what stuck with most Western viewers. While in-universe, this is intended to be a very serious moment, many have found it to be more comedic due to how outrageous it is, which I guess can be applied to a lot of JoJo if you think about it. This led to the quote being spread through 4chan's anime and manga board before eventually mutating into a source used for image and video edits all across the web. Reminder, this was around when the current JoJo's anime had first started airing. The absurdity and prominence of the meme had a far-reaching effect and led more people to check out the show out of curiosity to its context. JoJo Pose Throughout JoJo as a series, characters frequently pose in strange and often contorted fashions. Many have labeled these sorts of complex positions as JoJo poses. There isn't anything super complex in determining what is or isn't considered a JoJo pose. More often than not, any one position that looks awkward or bombastic in a sense can be claimed as one. It's really cool to see cosplayers pulling off some of these in pictures, as some of them look like they would never be able to be replicated in real life. Many seem to wonder why poses in JoJo are so unique in comparison to other anime and manga, and I actually have an interesting reason as to why this is the case. JoJo's bizarre adventure creator, Hirohiko Araki, has a particular interest in the world of fashion and models, with him often even directly referencing poses from fashion models in his work. Here are some cool examples of this and his illustrations. It's really cool to see a shonen heavy series like this take inspiration from such an interesting place. The world of fashion even has a distinct influence on JoJo's character designs, which is most heavily evident in part 4 onward. To be continued. In the original JoJo manga, many chapters and storylines would end with the ominous message of TO BE CONTINUED transcribed on an arrow. This was a signature play for the series, so when the anime adaptation came around, they ended every episode with the same TO BE CONTINUED arrow. This would then transition into the show's ending theme, which at the time of the first season was Roundabout by the band Yes. For one reason or another, people had latched onto this trend during its initial airing, much like the Dio meme I had talked about earlier. And thus, during the anime's first season, the To Be Continued Arrow became its own meme. While the arrow was primarily used for just ending a given episode, it became more and more associated for its use in the show's cliffhangers, enticing viewers to come back next week to find out what happens. Memes involving the arrow mirrored this tactic, presenting a clip that gets interrupted with the arrow right as something of interest is about to take place, enticing the viewer into wondering what happens next. A lot of this meme seems to be tied to videos of people getting injured, and uh, I approve. I, I love I love videos of people getting injured. <laughs> Much like the Dio stuff, this further helped JoJo break into the mainstream, and was one of the many driving forces in getting more people to check out the series. Family Guy to be continued reference. <sighs> I told you guys, uh, I'm not leaving any stone unturned. <sighs> 
Family Guy is an animated sitcom created by Seth MacFarlane. It focuses primarily on the wacky hijinks of the Griffin family, as well as various inconsequential cutaway gags. If you're wondering why this is relevant, and I'm sure you are, it's because JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is indirectly referenced during the show's 20th season. During the ending scene of Season 20, Episode 5, Brief Encounter, Stewie and Brian reenact the then-popular to-be-continued meme trend. The same one I discussed in the previous entry. They don't even mention Jojo by name whatsoever, which gives me the impression that the crew that worked on this episode may not have even been aware of the origin behind it, and just did the gag because they thought it was relevant at the time. This very much shows in the execution of the scene, since you can argue that they didn't even do it right. The main joke prevalent in most edits is that the moment of excitement or disaster is cut off right before it happens on screen. However, Family Guy instead cuts it off right after that moment happens. At the very least, they were able to get the right music for it, so uh, I'll give them that. Is this a JoJo reference? This is a fairly unassuming question turned viral meme, and is most often pointed towards as to why Western JoJo fans can be so insufferable at times. Look, this series has been around for a while. The manga has been running for a little over 30 years at this point, and has a very large fan base. So large, in fact, that it includes the likes of other creators. Authors, artists, game developers, plenty of creative people are fans of this series just like anybody else. And normally, when you're a fan of something, Something, it tends to influence your work in small or even large ways. JoJo is definitely no exception to this, as over the years, it's shared its DNA with plenty of different media. A famous example that I see used a lot to showcase this fact is actually Street Fighter of all things. Guile and Rose, for example, are both characters that have their design inspiration rooted in JJBA via the characters of Polnareff and Lisa Lisa, respectively. More specifically, Guile has a bit of Polnareff as well as Stroheim from Part 2. You can even see it in his style of very unique hair. Since the series hadn't had a huge presence in English-speaking countries, many of these references and inspirations would go over Western people's heads for a long while. This all changed when the anime adaptation became popular. All of a sudden, everyone was pointing out how some of their favorite media was influenced by JoJo, either by one-shot gags or full-blown mechanics on how a series works. At first, this was pretty cool. I see a lot of these sorts of initial realizations as sort of like when you finally get an adult joke in a cartoon you watched when you were younger, that feeling of having an information click in your mind for the first time, it's super satisfying. Though it didn't take long for this to get super fucking annoying. After a while, it seemed like JoJo fans had started asking, is this a JoJo reference in regards to everything imaginable? If it used colors in a wacky way, had weird characters, or anything remotely similar, annoying fans would just spam it with that repetitive question. Thankfully, this eventually mutated into something a bit more ironic, resulting in the creation of this image, a collection of stock photos with vague similarities to pre-existing JoJo content meant to make fun of people who spam the question. This image in and of itself became a meme, and then a bunch of people made a version of this image with other series. Sh shit, shit do be crazy. At least the question now is, is less annoying than it used to be. Giorno's theme. Okay, so this one is another sort of meme one, so bear with me here. Upon the release of the Part 5 Golden Wind anime adaptation, viewers were treated to some brand new music created for the season's original soundtrack. One notable song amongst the new catalog was entitled Il Vento d'Oro. This track is the main character Giorno's fighting song, or beatdown theme as many fans would call it. As of the writing of this video, each JoJo protagonist has gotten their own individual battle music along with their respective JoJo part adaptation and Giorno is no different. Though particularly, Giorno's theme plays the most frequently as he is about to gain an advantage or win a given fight. This has led to a slew of jokes and memes revolving around the song. Much like Guile's theme from Street Fighter and You Say Run from My Hero Academia, the song has been paired with plenty of scenes from other anime, video games, and movies. Actually, a uh, fun tidbit about this entry I want to share real quick. Il Vento d'Oro contains the lyrics Jojo Golden Wind, which which is a direct reference to the name of Part 5.
though my friend Mikey has constantly made the joke that this lyric kinda sounds like Jojo gonna win, hilariously coinciding with the fact that this music always seems to play as Giorno is about to win a huge fight. I'll play it again so you can hear what he means. I legit cannot unhear that now, and honestly, my brain has just accepted that those are the lyrics from now on, but it's definitely a lot more accurate now, I can say that. Casual viewer. Alright, now we're finally getting to the iceberg part of the iceberg image. Some of these entries are still pretty basic, but if you know these, odds are you probably have some familiarity with the series or fan culture online. Araki doesn't age. The creator of JoJo, Hirohiko Araki, is a very strange fellow. I'm not the first one to point this out, and I definitely won't be the last by any means. Many of the interviews conducted with him have yielded some very strange dialogue and insight into his character, none of which has any sort of coherent explanation. One of my favorite instances of this is from a public talk done by Araki's wife, Chami, back in 2009. In this talk, Chami discusses her husband's weird habits, and even recounts one instance where she walked in on him yelling incoherently, acting as if he was possessed while he illustrated his work. Though one of his strangest qualities doesn't necessarily have to do with how he acts, but instead, how he looks. Let me explain. Over the years, numerous fans have pointed out that for some unidentified reason, Araki doesn't look like he's aged at all. Sure, his hairstyle might be a little bit different, but in some cases, he sometimes even looks like he's gotten a little younger. Believe it or not, he's actually in his 60s as of the making of this video. That's right, I'm not joking, the dude you're looking at right now is 62 years old. Many people have theorized about why this could be the case for years, swapping around jokes online about him potentially being a Hamon user or even a vampire of all things. Turns out, it actually might be way simpler than that. A little too simple, if you ask me. According to one interview, when questioned about his youthful appearance, Araki said that he washes his face every morning with Tokyo's tap water. No moisturizer, no plastic surgery, just slapping some Tokyo tap on his face. I am extremely envious of this man's life. Oh? You're approaching me? This quote refers to an iconic scene from Part 3, Stardust Crusaders. Its most well-known incarnation is the one portrayed in the colored version of the manga released by Shueisha exclusively in Japan, September of 2012. The scene in question depicting a moment leading up to Jotaro and Dio's final battle in Egypt, where they can be seen walking towards each other from across the sidewalk. This is a legendary panel, and in a way, is hard for me to describe. I guess I feel like it encapsulates everything that makes Jojo Jojo. It's wacky, intense, and really hypes me up to turn the page in a way that not a lot of manga does. It's so iconic and even recognizable, in fact, that tons upon tons of artists and media have referenced this particular scene. This is either done in a sort of jokey recreation using pre-existing characters, or in the case of Sonic, of all things, blatantly referenced in the official IDW comic series. This panel comes from issue number 32, if you want to find it for yourself. Self. Yeah, no, this is not uh, a joke. Sonic did this. The Wordo. This is an often misconstrued line originating from various adaptations of Part 3, from animation to even video games. In the series, Dio is revealed to be able to stop time during the final battle in Egypt using his stand called The World, and he seemingly activates this ability through saying its name out loud in a dramatic fashion. Though due to Dio's original voice actors across various adaptations being Japanese, he instead sounds like he's mistakenly saying The Wordo in instead of just the world. Interestingly enough though, the pronunciation of this line in Japanese is in fact correct. 
Unlike what most English speakers would assume, in Japanese, Zawodo is actually how the world is written in katakana. So it may sound kind of odd to us due to the language barrier, but in Japanese, this is just how it's normally said. Despite all this, however, the phrase would go on to become an inside joke within the non-Japanese speaking community, with many people referring to his stand as Zawodo as a sort of gag. Read the manga! This phrase refers to a commonly accepted mindset amongst many hardcore fans of the series. As of the writing of this video, the anime has only adapted the first six or so arcs of the series, capping off at Stone Ocean. The manga, on the other hand, has been being written since 1987, and now is currently starting on part 9. This leaves a pretty sizable gap of story untold between adaptations. The mantra is then simple. Fans believe that if you enjoy the anime, you should take some time to read the manga. I personally agree with this, as upon my first watch through back in high school, I did that exact thing and loved my time with it. If you're a fan of the show, I highly suggest taking the plunge. There is so much content that exists beyond the anime right now if you're craving more. No pressure though, of course. If you'd rather just watch the anime, then that's fine too. That's totally valid, the anime has been great. Just try to be wary of spoilers, they're definitely out there. 7 Page Muda this is a personal favorite of mine and many other fans. In the part 5 manga, Giorno has a fight that ends with the series' signature move, an enormous wave of rapid punches known as a stand rush. In that sense, it isn't super remarkable, there are many others like it. But what does make it special is that it's the single longest stand rush in the entire series, spanning a total of 7 entire pages. To give you some perspective, each JoJo chapter of parts 1 through 6 is around 20 pages in length each. That means that this beatdown lasted for close to half of that length in total. That's why this is so well known, it is very long, but what if I told you that this wasn't always the case? I actually found out that originally, the beatdown was only 5 pages when it was first published in Weekly Shonen Jump. However, Araki drew 2 extra pages for the beatdown for the eventual final volume release. I'm fairly unclear on why he went back and added to it, but looking in retrospect, it really does serve to make the whole encounter just that much more satisfying. Like, yeah dude, beat Chocolata's ass! Absolutely decimate! this man, this is like some live leak shit. Plenty of fans hoped that this scene would be given proper justice in the anime adaptation, and I'm happy to report that that is indeed the case. In the anime, the beatdown clocks in at around 30 whole seconds in length, with the voice actors for Giorno in both the sub and the dub giving an incredible vocal performance. People don't pass me the aux anymore because this is my favorite song. <laughs> Don't skip parts. This is a pretty universally accepted rule amongst fans of the series. Never, ever skip parts. There seems to be a sort of common misconception amongst some fans that this alternate way of experiencing the series is valid, skipping around from part to part, arc to arc, only reading and watching what you prefer. Many hardcore purists, however, absolutely despise this mindset, believing that the only proper way to enjoy the series is in what they believe to be its intended order, how it was chronologically released. I will say though, and I realize how unholy this is for me to even utter out loud, I do think that this alternative viewing concept does have some merit, and I can totally understand why so many people think this way. Every part in JoJo is fairly disconnected from the previous, each having their own unique cast of characters and only sharing some loose connections to previous story arcs. Many people come into the series with this already in mind, so they come to think that jumping around is fine. I've already seen this talked about and discussed by other people online, but damn it, this is my video and I have my own two cents on the issue that I need to get off of my chest. First, I just want to say that something that a lot of people don't seem to think about is progression. Not of the story per se, but of the author's writing and their process. This is kind of a stupid point to begin with here, but the reason that Jojo is so engaging to me personally is that I see it as a Rocky trying to one-up himself with every story that he writes. The reason it's so bizarre in the first place is that it starts as a fairly straightforward plot about evil vampires, and somehow maneuvers its way to being about people that fight with invisible ghosts that can punch really fast and have insanely over 
overpowered abilities. It's kind of hard to outright explain, but there's a linear growth to that. The series gets stranger and more out there with each oncoming part, and you can come to appreciate that simple progression. My second point is that even though the story doesn't carry over between arcs all that much, there still is some connection there that I find super interesting. I would honestly be baffled if somebody dove into part 3 without knowing who Dio is. His imposing presence in part 1 Phantom Blood helps contextualize how much of a brooding force he is in part 3, and with time having passed during part 2 Battle Tendency, it makes Dio's return all that more interesting and raises some pretty cool questions. How will characters that we know now, like Joseph Joestar, react to Dio? Joseph already knows the history of what happened in Phantom Blood, but he's never met the guy himself. It's a cool feeling, because the isolation of the two previous parts almost makes Part 3 Stardust Crusaders feel like a giant crossover in a sense. Finally, I think what's super important to note while talking about this is Araki's reluctance to bring back older characters and how that affects how we perceive characters that do get to return. Araki doesn't really do cool fan service as much as other writers, so whenever he brings back an older character, it's a real treat. Seeing someone like Koichi from Part 4 show up to set the stage for the events of Part 5 is really awesome and cool, and I don't think his appearance would have the proper context or impact if you hadn't really seen the previous arc. Overall, I just personally don't see the point in skipping parts. In a sense, it sort of feels like self-sabotage. It completely alters the way that you experience the story compared to others, and I don't think it's necessarily in a cool way either. But honestly, you know, my thoughts on this are just words. At the end of the day, I don't want to gatekeep here. If the only way you'll check out this series is by skipping around, then be my guest, have fun with it. I just wanted to let people know what they might be missing out on in a non-hostile way. Because God knows there's a million people out there that'll probably rip you to shreds for even thinking about this. And hey, if you're one of those people, for the love of God, man, calm yourself. Let people do whatever they want. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day. None of this matters. Listen, somebody watching part four first is not going to lead to the murder of your entire family. And who knows, maybe it might even inspire them to check out everything the series has to offer. I don't mean to be an asshole about it, but just like... I, I hate elitism over this shit, I just hate it so much. Jorno's true father is Jonathan. Given the context behind this statement, it's kind of true. Early on in part 5, we're told by the narrator that Jorno is Dio's son, which would have technically made him the first protagonist that isn't a part of the Joestar bloodline, but it isn't that simple. After stealing Jonathan's body at the end of part 1 and reawakening in part 3, it's canon that Dio got around. What I'm saying is that he's a massive slut. He went on to sleep around with a bunch of women during his time in Egypt before going on to kill all of them. In particular though, at least for this case, one person of interest was able to escape for unknown reasons. This person would then go on to give birth to Giorno. As I said, this happened after Dio attached his head to Jonathan's body, technically making the junk with the gunk Jonathan's junk. But what I think this technically means is that Giorno is more so Jonathan's son rather than Dio. But I don't know, this is vampire shenanigans, I don't know how this works. Eyes of Heaven JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Eyes of Heaven is a video game based on the JoJo series that was originally released in Japan in 2015. As of this video, it's currently one of the more recent official game releases, and therefore is one of the more well-known ones, aided by the fact that it actually got localized in English-speaking territories. Though the game's gameplay is a mixed bag, what makes it compelling is its plot. Unlike other officially licensed JoJo games, Eyes of Heaven is unique in the sense that it doesn't adapt previous arcs of the series. In Instead, opting to create a new original story featuring the characters from all pre-existing parts at the time. It's interesting to note that the story of this game was actually overseen by Hirohiko Araki himself, which normally doesn't happen that much on this sort of scale. And damn does he go off the shits here, oh my god! As said before, it's quite rare for Araki to bring back older characters, so this game was a special treat to be sure. Even if the game isn't canon to the main series, its plot functions as a sort of pseudo-alternate ending 
to the original run of the manga. And that's super cool. For context, many people were dissatisfied with Stone Ocean's ending for being fairly unfulfilling in their eyes, so I think this was a pretty great way to make up for it. The game even features a brand spanking new design for its main antagonist that was conceptualized by Araki himself. Here's a very vague picture of it so I don't spoil it for anyone who might be interested in checking it out. You may not be able to tell what it looks like due to this low-res concept art, but I can assure you it looks very cool and very evil. The game also has plenty of unique interactions between characters, fan fiction levels of crossovers, and fully voice acted cutscenes by the Japanese voice cast. So if you finished reading and watching through parts 1 through 8, I highly suggest taking a look at the game, or even just watching the cutscenes online. If you're a fan of the series and craving more beyond the main stuff, you'll definitely enjoy yourself. I feel like I'm probably gonna tell people to check out a lot of the stuff on this list. I'm... I'm just excited. Rohan OVAs. Okay, so this section of the iceberg is gonna be a little bit long, but there's a lot of interesting stuff here, so please bear with me. First, we gotta establish what an OVA is. OVA is an acronym that stands for Original Video Animation. Fun fact, in the early 2000s, OVAs were sometimes referred to as OAV instead, switching the letters around. This was done since OVA was often grammatically corrected to original animation video in the US, but most people just call it the former regardless, and honestly, it has a better ring to it anyway. These things are usually created with the intent of being included alongside certain home video releases of shows or movies. Some of my favorite examples of how cool these things are would be the One Punch Man OVAs. This series of original animation was essentially just extra episodes of the first season, containing content that wasn't found in the source material, but helped give more context to the world and characters. Of course, with that being said, not all OVAs have to function without source material, such as the case with Thus Spoke Kashibe Rohan. This series is one of the few spin-offs to JoJo's Bizarre Adventure illustrated and written by Hirohiko Araki starting in 1997. It's a collection of one-shot stories revolving around everyone's favorite fictional manga artist Rohan Kishibe. Or, or is it Rohan Kishibe? I don't care. I don't care. It's interesting to note that the release schedule is fairly sporadic in comparison to the consistent schedule of the main JoJo series, only rarely getting chapters every couple of months or even years. Although this doesn't stop it from being a great read. Thus Spoke Kishibe Rohan is a fantasy horror series, with each release being around 50 to 60 pages in length. Each episode, as they're called, features the titular Rohan Kishibe, who either actively participates in some weird event happening or recounts it in some way. For the most part, there isn't much interconnective tissue between these stories whatsoever, besides one or two returning characters, so in that sense, I guess you could consider it an anthology. This aspect is reflected in the chapters themselves, being numbered in a seemingly randomized order, with its premiere chapter being episode 16. Being one of the more prominent JoJo spin-offs, many people wondered if these stories would ever get adapted into an animated format just like the core series, and it turns out that would eventually be confirmed to be the case. Being first announced on April 15th of 2016, Thus Spoke Kishibe Rohan was set to be adapted into a series of OVAs by David Production amidst the creation of the main JoJo anime. Just like the manga, these OVAs started to release sporadically beginning in 2017 and were met with praise by fans. Not only were these faithful adaptations to the source material, but David Productions went out of their way to adapt them in Araki's most up-to-date art style, which was a first for the time. While some people were initially turned off by this by how weird the characters looked animated, the studio eventually got their footing with it and produced some truly fantastic visuals. It even released with its own entirely new opening and ending sequences with some fantastic new music to accompany them. This new track was created by Koda, a fan favorite musician who helped create various bits of the soundtrack for the series in the past, most notably performing as the vocalist for Bloody Stream in Part 2 and Fighting Gold in Part 5. Okay, so now with all that basic information out of the way, I want to tell you how batshit insane the release of some of these were. Like, genuinely, these were not easy to find and watch compared to the main series. They're way more accessible now, but at the time of their initial releases, they were infamous. In particular, the release of the first OVA was a fucking nightmare. The premiere entry of the series, Millionaire Village, was announced alongside the start of the Diamond is Unbreakable anime and could only be watched by people who collected 
collected every subsequent Blu-ray of Part 4 as they were released. Basically, by putting all of the physical releases together, you could receive this extra episode. If that already sounds stupid, hold on, it gets worse. Given the length of Part 4 Diamond is Unbreakable and the fact that most anime productions make their money through Blu-ray sales, getting this Rohan OVA initially was not a cheap task whatsoever. If you actually wanted to go through with this, the whole thing ended up being a total of 13 different Blu-ray discs at an overall cost of around $600. Just to get a smidge of extra content? That is insane! I'm a diehard fan of this series, and even I think that's a bit crazy. But wait, there's more to this. You would think that once they were brought together, you could simply just, you know, go on a website and input a proof of purchase or something, but no! They decided to make it extremely archaic. Upon collecting all of them, you would have to mail in a proof of purchase that was included with each Blu-ray. That being a flimsy piece of paper paper that came with each set that could very easily be lost in the shuffle. Then, and only then, after a few weeks or so, you would receive your very own copy of the first OVA. Obviously, this was a weirdly complicated process that plenty of folks hated and actively struggled with, not to mention the fact that you could only receive the OVA on a DVD of all things, instead of a Blu-ray like all the other discs you had collected thus far. The whole thing, I, I swear to God, was just baffling. I think David Production must have realized this because they went on to do a much better job with their second release, Mutsukabe Hill. This OVA was simply just bundled with the release of the second volume of the Thus Spoke Kashibe Rohan manga. It was pretty simple and easy to nab for collectors, and not a huge time and money sink. The last two, and currently the most recent OVA releases, At the Confessional and The Run, originally premiered in cinemas instead of a standard home release. This was also very cool. Thankfully later on, all four of these animations would be bundled together in a Blu-ray collector's edition set only available in Japan. Sadly, up to this point, these releases were never officially made available internationally, so if you're like me and you lived in America, uh, there was no way to watch this series officially in any capacity. However, that all changed when Netflix, of all people, picked up the exclusive streaming rights to the entire catalog in June of 2021. This acquisition would also end up including dubs of the episodes recorded in multiple languages, which I think is pretty cool. Here's hoping that any further additions to this series find their way onto Netflix as well. A and maybe we could get a cool physical release? Maybe? Nah, we all know they're never gonna do that. <sighs> Hello and welcome to Araki's Quote Corner, a disturbing look into the insane life of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure creator, Hirohiko Araki. The following quote and story is 100% real. I couldn't make this up even if I tried. I have a younger sister, in her 50s, and apparently she fell and broke her leg. Was it minor? Was she severely hurt? I had no idea. And then my sister said she wouldn't be attending an Araki family celebration. So I called her and asked, is your leg okay? And my sister responded, Ufu. Just. That. What in the world? Why couldn't she give me an answer? This sister has a daughter in her 20s, so I asked her, How's your mom's leg doing? And she responded, Ufu. Just. That. Are they telling me to use my imagination to discern the hidden meaning behind Ufu? What is Ufu? When he says he doesn't want a relationship, and then during sex he says whose pussy is that? It ain't yours. Average fan, welcome to tier 3. This section is going to start covering stuff that your average fan may already know about, but I'll be covering them in much more detail. Some entries on here I had a base familiarity with, but there's some cool tidbits I hadn't known about that I thought would be cool to include. Speedwagon is best waifu. This is a loaded statement. As you may already know, Speedwagon is a fan favorite character most prominent in the first two parts of JoJo. Even in death, his contributions to the Joestars manifest in the Speedwagon Foundation, with their only goal being to just seemingly help the family in any way that they can. 
The term waifu is slang used by the anime community to refer to a female fictional character from a given anime or manga that a viewer or fanbase particularly likes. The word is obviously derived from the English phrase wife, which insinuates the label as feminine in the first place. While many basic anime fans argue who the best waifu is in any given show, almost 100% of the time, the JoJo fanbase mutually agrees that Speedwagon is, in fact, the best girl. Despite not identifying as a woman and there being plenty of actual female characters in the cast, Speedwagon's undying passion and charm has allowed for him to ascend the limiting nature of gender to allow him to become a top tier waifu. Speedwagon loves Jonathan Joestar, and we love Speedwagon. Though despite the fanbase's obvious love for the man and his pure heart of gold, Araki doesn't seem to feel the same way. Ever since his last appearance in Part 2 Battle Tendency, Araki has yet to feature him in any of his artwork since. I'm not joking when I say this. Try to find Speedwagon drawn in Araki's modern day art style. You just won't. It seems like he's just not that interested in everyone's unproblematic fave. I hope he gets something by the time Iraqi retires. I just want to see my boy thriving like everyone else. Just, just, just draw a little sketch, please. Joseph reading Superman. Early on in part two, Battle Tendency, we're treated to a brief flashback scene where Joseph showcases his Hamon abilities for the first time. This whole ordeal, of course, first taking place in the midst of a hostage situation aboard a plane. Joseph, not giving much of a shit, initially does nothing, silently sitting in the back seat and reading a book. In the manga, despite being cut off, we can clearly see that Joseph is reading a Superman comic book, which is a really cool and fairly direct reference. But funnily enough, timeline-wise, this is seemingly impossible. This is because that although the story of Part 2 does take place in 1938, the same year the first Superman comic was published, the scene where Joseph is reading it, like I said, is a flashback sequence, which is shown taking place at least a year prior. However, it seems that Araki merely included this just to reference the fact that Part 2's main story takes place the same year it was published, and thought it would be a cool easter egg even if it didn't make sense contextually. Also, if you're wondering, the scene is different in the anime adaptation. Instead of Superman, Joseph is reading a comic entitled Bao, which is a reference to one of Araki's past works, Bao the Visitor. It just works! This is a joke phrase and a commonly repeated meme in relation to Jojo Part 5 Golden Wind. Before the days of the anime release, and to some extent, even now, many people are confused as to how exactly Diavolo's stand, King Crimson, actually works. A lot of people attribute this to various poor translations of the original manga making their rounds online, but many actually refute this, saying that it's instead more of a sink or swim sort of thing. Either you understand it, or you don't. It's not the scam necessarily, it's the person reading them and the many ways they can interpret the information being represented, or reading too deep into what some believe to be a fairly simple concept. It didn't help that multiple internet posts that attempted to properly explain the ability to those confused had all featured differing explanations amongst themselves. One of the most accepted of these explanations, though, was a YouTube video entitled This Is How King Crimson Works. Being around only 40 seconds in length, it uses footage of a waffle falling over as a setup for explaining how the ability functions. But even this was eventually disputed. The anime made things a bit easier to understand. Since it's an ability that has to do with time manipulation, having a real-time showcase helped more people actually realize how it functioned. Even so, today, people are still divided on the specifics. As more and more questions online were still asking how the ability worked with still no concrete answers available, many fans took to replying to them with the simple statement, it it just works. This statement encompassed the passive annoyance that so many people were having amidst the debates, and made for some great jokes. So the next time you see a JoJo fan asking any sort of question, shut them down with a meme, because fuck them. Also, just before anybody asks, please don't expect me to explain how King Crimson works. I think I have a pretty good understanding of how it functions, but explaining it is a whole different beast. Also, I just don't want to do it wrong and then get corrected later. I just, I, I don't, I don't feel like it. All-Star Battle 
JoJo's Bizarre Adventure All-Star Battle is a video game for the PS3 released in Japan on August 29th, 2013. The game would later make its way to English-speaking territories in 2014. All-Star Battle is a 3D fighting game in which players can take control of various JoJo characters for one-on-one -on -one matches. Similar to Eyes of Heaven, which came later, this game also features a cast of characters from all throughout JoJo's history, spanning from Part 1 all the way up to Part 8. Although, in comparison to its later follow-up, the game didn't feature a brand new plot, but rather a retelling of each arc individually as its main story mode. Kind of like an early 2000s Dragon Ball game where they just kind of recapped all the story. It's like that. Although, what it didn't have in new content, it definitely made up for in presentation. Chock full of references and other cool stuff, it was a beloved game despite any flaws it had and would serve as an introduction to JoJo for many Western fans. It was so well regarded that it would even receive a new coat of paint in 2022, with an official remaster of the game entitled All-Star Battle R. This re-release would feature new gameplay mechanics, characters, and voice actors reprising their roles from the anime. Speaking of, the original release of the game would mark the first time that many JoJo characters got proper voice actors or any sort of animated representation. This is the case for characters introduced way later on in the manga especially, like Johnny and Gyro. It was because of this that the game had a heavy focus on fanservice for manga readers in particular. But interestingly, this wouldn't be the first time that characters from Part 4 in particular would get representation like this. Ultra Jump Commercials Okay, so these are super interesting. Over the years, the magazine Ultra Jump has had a series of commercials in Japan that included various JoJo characters. These advertisements were produced by Kamikaze Doga, who might sound familiar as they were the same group who created the opening sequences for the anime adaptation. You know, those really cool 3D ones that start every episode. The cast of characters that were used for these promotions span from parts 4, 5, 6, and even 8, with all of them first airing from 2012 to 2016. This means that a lot of these were released years before their anime adaptation counterparts, making these commercials some of the first animated versions of a lot of fan-favorite characters. Some of these ads are animated in the standard anime style, while some are presented more like motion comics. In specific, commercials that include characters from parts 4 and 5 are fully 2D animated. Animated. The reason I think that this is super cool beyond, you know, just existing, is that these were created and stylized in a way that's way different than what we got with the current day anime series. These commercials have also been frequently reused and re-edited for several different occasions. These remixed versions of the same advertisement usually come with a couple of script and visual changes. In one example, the Part 4 commercial gets a winter makeover by placing snow everywhere, including on top of Josuke's pompadour. Also, depending on which commercial you watch, Koichi's design will be different. Different. In the first draft of the series, his design resembles one of the hairstyles he gains after the Yukako fight early on in Diamond is Unbreakable. Later, his design changes to reflect his look after having fought Kira for the first time. Along with all this, there are various other smaller additions to the scene in each iteration, like the inclusion of all of the characters' stands, and Yukako even looking through the window on the side. Being the first time that a lot of these elements made it to the small screen, I'm sure that these ads were a real treat for fans at the time clamoring for a proper anime. It also kind of lets us peer into this alternate universe where maybe part 4 could have looked like this on TV instead of what we got. I don't know, I, I, I just think that's cool. I like seeing alternate takes of animation. It's, it's just cool. Also, as a fun little extra piece of trivia, one of the various versions of the Part 4 commercial includes a stand cameo from Harvest. Strangely, just like the modern anime adaptation, Harvest was animated via 3D CGI animation. So even back nearly eight years ago, they were still using the same method of animation that would later be used by David Production. I just think that's interesting, you know, it's it, just a little tidbit. I, I just like it. I just wanted to share it, you know, you know. Dead Man's Questions Speaking of Part 4, Dead Man's Questions. It's a thing that exists and is related to JoJo. 
My script writing skills fucking suck. Dead Man's Questions is a short story manga written and illustrated by Hirohiko Araki that seemingly takes place within the original JoJo's canon. I say seemingly because the series never really received any sort of follow-up, nor was it ever referenced in the main manga continuity. I'll give a brief synopsis of what the one-shot is about before diving into spoilers so you can decide if you want to read it for yourself if you haven't already. I think that conceptually, it's a very interesting idea. The story follows a mysterious wandering spirit who suffers from amnesia, not being able to remember who he was or any of his past when he was alive. Being a ghost trapped in the living world, most of his existence is spent being miserable, longing for true happiness. That is, until one day he's able to meet and converse with a strange female monk who is still alive. It's unclear how this communication is made possible, but the monk convinces the spirit to work for her and clean up some dirty work in exchange for money. Before you ask what a ghost would do with money, uh, I have no idea. I don't think it's ever specified. What is specified? though is that the dirty work involves killing people. The spirit seems totally indifferent to all this and instead believes that by making this job his purpose, he might eventually find true happiness. So yeah, that's your setup. Rebellious Ghost Bounty Hunter goes on wacky adventures, hijinks ensue. If it interests you, I would highly suggest checking it out and reading it for yourself. And if you don't want to be spoiled on its connections to Jojo and any twists it may have in store, skip to this timestamp here. All right, let's talk spoilers. In isolation, Dead Man's Questions is a fairly decent series of short stories with a cool concept, but its importance grows when connected back to part four, Diamond is Unbreakable, as I implied earlier. While this story initially has little to do with Jojo and seems to be entirely its own thing, it's revealed by its end that the main character that we've been following is actually the wandering spirit of Kira Yoshikage. This isn't just a fan theory either, it's directly confirmed at the end of the story, clear as day. Presumably, after being dragged away by the ghostly hands at the end of part four, Kira became an amnesiac ghost with no idea as to his true identity. With no knowledge of his past, he's effectively made the protagonist of the story. While I would have liked for it to have gone on longer and maybe have been expanded into its own larger scale series, Dead Man's Question stayed a one-shot story with no clear information relating to its canonicity to the core JoJo series. Regardless though, Kira would later receive an alternate costume and reference to the manga in the Eyes of Heaven video game, so, eh, you know, that's pretty cool. Interestingly, Araki had actually wanted to write something similar to Dead Man's Questions with themes about the afterlife later on during the development of Part 5, but apparently he didn't feel like it was the right time, so in the future he may revisit the idea or expand it into something entirely new. Who knows? Not me! Heritage for the Future JoJo's bizarre adventure, Heritage for the Future, is probably one of the most iconic JoJo video games to ever exist. Even if you haven't heard of it by name, you may know it by its sound design, voice work, or even its beautifully crafted sprite animation. That last bit even being reused online a lot, like many places. The game is notable for being one of the first times that Capcom got their hands on the JoJo license, and man, what a way to showcase what this studio could do with it. Released in arcades in 1998 before being ported to home consoles in 1999, Heritage for the Future is a 2D fighting game based on the story and cast of Part 3, Stardust Crusaders. Reception-wise, the game did quite well. It had this unique stand-based fighting system that set it apart from other fighters at the time, leading to some unique and interesting tactics in gameplay. And of course, the the art style. Absolutely no one can argue with how incredible its visuals were and still are today. The spray work and backgrounds especially are so vibrant and animated. You can tell that the people working on it really cared about adapting the source material in a fresh creative way. And this isn't just a case of me assuming things either. The people who were on staff at Capcom at the time were massive Jojo heads and were dying to work on the game. I mentioned it before, but some character designs for Capcom Street Fighter were directly inspired by Araki's work on JoJo, so it was pretty clear for a while that Capcom was perfect for a project like this. 
Let me just take you aside for a moment and give you a little fun fact. Midler, the stand user for High Priestess, was actually redesigned by Hirohiko Araki himself, specifically for this game. I guess that Capcom wanted to adapt Midler into a fully playable fighter to help fill out the roster for the game, but found it difficult to work with how she appeared in the manga at that point. And when I say how she appeared, I of course mean as a generic corpse that is only shown on screen for about a page or two. Yeah, not really uh, not really that much to work with. Heritage for the Future was one of the first times that a JoJo game would receive a localization outside of Japan, and with that in mind, it was bound to make some sort of impact overseas. Obviously, this was before the manga was more widely localized, and before the serialized anime that we have now was even a blip on the radar. Much of the Western exposure to JoJo at the time was out of context to the greater series, and in the case of Heritage for the Future, many players were unaware of the story that that existed beyond it. Now, all of this, at least to me, along with the game's polish and quality, made it stick out to many who had the chance to play it. Now, look, JoJo, we all know, it's a strange series, but out of context, it can be construed as even stranger than it actually is. This sort of thing makes an impact, and nothing can reflect that impact more than the absolute calvacade of videos, animations, and images that use the game's aforementioned assets. Like I said, you may not have known about this game before, but you were probably exposed to its contents in one way or another via memes or animations that used its sound files and sprite work. I still see this spread of Dio just making the rounds and like memes and shit. The game's data was even recycled into other official Capcom properties, with some of its unique sound effects finding their way into games like Marvel vs. Capcom 2 and even the Street Fighter series. Yes, Street Fighter, the thing I just said had aspects of it that were inspired by JoJo. See, see right there? It's, it's a big full circle thing. Yeah, I bet you weren't expecting that. Also, you know, because it's just, you know, a little bit relevant to the conversation, but uh, I happen to own an original, unopened Japanese copy of the game. And if you think that I purposefully built up this subject on the iceberg just so that I could make this purchase seem way more impressive for clout, you'd be right. Follow my Twitter. <laughs> Duang. Okay, so to get into this, I need to give you some context. In the early to mid 2000s, the JoJo fanbase in the West would be a far ways away from what it would become in recent years. It was relatively tiny at the time and cute and, uh, you know, less annoying. And the reasoning behind this was that there was a large lack of any official JoJo content making its way over to English-speaking territories. At the time, the only officially licensed content available to potential fans was the Part 3 OVA and the Heritage for the Future fighting game. Now, before you type anything in the comments or, or say anything, these were both great in their own way. But what was remarkably absent was the source material itself the original manga. Spin-off material and adaptations are awesome, but without the original manga, much of it was viewed out of its original context, or lacking in any sort of clear overall story. Viz Media would eventually pick up the license for translating Stardust Crusaders in 2005, but even this came with some issues. For whatever reason, not only did it skip over the first two parts of the story, but Viz Media also took over five years to officially translate and release the entire thing. For reference, Stardust Crusader's original manga run in Japan only took three years. That's like if a college student handed in their project three weeks overdue and only completed the second half of the assignment. With its recent surge in popularity, Viz Media is now much better with the property overall, but before the anime adaptation, things were much different than they are now. Despite this, from the various scraps of content people had seen at the time, they were positively received. A side a sizable number of people were in fact interested in this strange world of punching ghosts and magical artifacts, and upon learning that there was much, much more to discover, they started to take it upon themselves to seek it out. Alright, so this is kind of a new territory here. The art of fan translations and fan-made scans of manga is nothing new at all. While many newer fans of the medium can enjoy their favorite series posted weekly and on official platforms, this was not always the case. Before the anime boom of recent years with stuff like Crunchyroll and Funimation, a lot of Japanese media was never officially published all that much in Western territories, and for the most part was largely 
largely inaccessible. The way that a lot of this stuff made it over to the West in the first place was because of the people. Die-hard fans would end up being the people burdened with the responsibility of translating and circulating stuff around their community. Everything from bootleg DVDs being sold at local conventions to bulk downloads of manga amateurly translated online. It wasn't the most optimal thing in the world, but hey, it worked. This was the sort of territory that the JoJo fanbase had found itself in during the 2000s. Without that much officially published media, fans just kind of did it themselves. Many people began to form small communities online, scanning the manga and circulating it around the internet. Now, many of these scans remained untranslated for some time. Obviously, with the community still being in its infancy, getting a bilingual person to help translate it, as well as someone to work on the lettering for that translation, it was a lot to ask. However, because of a strange turn of events, one person was actually able to hit that jackpot. At some point during this period, an anonymous internet user was hard at work trying to find and scan the entirety of Part 4 Diamond is Unbreakable. This was a fairly large task, and it wasn't helped by the fact that they were personally unable to translate said scans themselves. Now, take the following with a grain of salt, but it was rumored that the scanner got in contact with the translator that was interested in working on the scans, and of course, translating them all to English. But many people have tossed around ideas that they may have wanted to help out so that they could further develop their foreign language skills. And thus, a fruitful partnership between the two began. Over the next few weeks, the two would send scans back and forth between one another. Interestingly, the translator worked at an incredible pace, being able to send over three to four volumes of edited scans every few days. If they wanted to practice their foreign language skills like many people assume that they were, that would have given the impression that they were relatively new to work like this, and would have taken longer to complete each batch of scans, but that clearly wasn't the case. So if this were indeed true, why would so many people assume that this person was in fact an amateur? Well, turns out, they seemingly were new to this, because despite their work ethic being insanely productive, the results… Eh, they were less than desirable. Not only was the text formatting extremely poor and hard to read, but the quality of the translation itself was bad, dude. I'm talking borderline incomprehensible. Most of the scans were riddled with spelling mistakes, and the bulk of the translations weren't even remotely similar to the content of the original. I'm not joking when I say that a majority of this was borderline unreadable, especially at the time. As a reminder, when these were first released onto the internet, they were the only way for English readers to experience part 4. I'm insanely lucky that I joined the fandom after better scans were made available. Diamond is Unbreakable is my favorite JoJo part of all time. I cannot imagine reading it like this would have allowed it to become the arc of my choice. These infamous translations would go on to be dubbed by fans as the Duang scans. The reason for the name was based on the fact that various characters referred to the town of Morio, where the story takes place, as Duang. This iconic panel of Kira being a standout example of this. You know, funny enough, there's actually a reason why this error is consistent throughout the entire translation. You see, the original scans of Part 4 that they were using as a base were the Taiwanese translations of Part 4 by Tong Li Publishing. Interestingly, the word Duang is just the town name of Morio, just you know, in Chinese. Its inclusion is the result of a literal translation between the two. So, in some senses, although it's weird and funny sounding to us, it's also sort of correct within the parameters of the translation itself. Like, we might make fun of this translation, but technically, they were kind of correct on calling it Duang. There just wasn't a translation for that name. Still, you know, hard to read, but uh, kind of correct. While at the time, using these to read the story was a pain in the ass, as fans got access to better and better translations over the coming years, many found themselves having a soft spot for these older, wackier scans. Many people even went on to regard Duang as a sort of rite of passage for being a true JoJo fanatic. A lot of these translations are, in fact, so bad that they're hilarious. Especially now that we have proper context as to what the fuck they were originally trying to say, a lot of these are just really fucking funny. 
To this day, Duang remains an interesting footnote in not only the history of the JoJo fan community, but the English-speaking manga community in general. Over the next few years, the translation would bounce back and forth between relevance and obscurity, but interestingly enough, Joel from Vine Sauce, of all people, would be one of the few to help further popularize it online. In 2015, Joel would upload a video dubbing over various dialogue from the original scans with his his unique comedic sensibilities. What a beautiful duet. True. Due to the popularity of the original video, he would later upload a sequel three years later to a similar response. Also, <laughs> just as a quick thing, because it's gonna bother the shit out of me if I don't bring it up, this panel right here that depicts Killer Queen with the phrase, I am the fucking strong, this is often associated with the Duang scans by many fans. But actually, it doesn't come from Duang at all. That's right, kids, wrap it up. The Fun Police is here. I'm, I'm a member of the Fun Police. Uh, no fun here. In Duang, the panel actually just says, you can't escape. I am the fucking strong is just a normal meme edit of the manga. Just thought I would point that out because uh, I see a lot of other people mistakenly using it alongside other Duang panels online. So uh, yeah, sorry to burst anyone's bubbles, but I, you can still find the meme edit funny. You're allowed, it's, it's okay. If for some reason you're interested in reading Duang scans for yourself, they're actually easy to find online with a quick Google search. However, as a brief trigger warning, uh, the mistranslations do include quite a few instances of the characters dropping the R slur. If you're comfortable with reading stuff like that, go on ahead, you know, whatever. But if you're like me and you're really not comfortable with it, I would just personally stick to the highlights that you can find scattered across Google Images. No shame here whatsoever, I totally understand. Shoko Nakagawa Interview Shoko Nakagawa is an interesting person. Although you may not know her by name, you may be familiar with her if you've ever watched the show Gurren Lagann, as she performed as the vocalist for both of the anime's opening themes. This is how many Westerners have been exposed to her work. But besides that though, she is well known for being a popular TV personality, as well as an actress, cosplayer, writer, illustrator, and for the purposes of this entry on the iceberg, a huge JoJo fan. And when I say huge fan, that is no understatement. She loves this series to her dying breath and over the years has dedicated a significant portion of her cosplay career specifically to dress as JoJo characters and recreate JoJo poses. At one point, she even broke her tailbone trying to emulate a pose from Narancia in part five during a live concert. Regardless of this, however, she went on to finish her performance before going to the hospital. Calling her committed would be massively underplaying it. The reason that she's listed here is due to a now infamous interview that she had with Hirohiko Araki back in 2007. For a brief three-year period, Shoko had become a regular host on a Japanese television program called Tamaiki Now. Really hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, but if I'm not, then fucking whatever. I'm still not even halfway done with the entire script at this point, and uh, my patience is waning. Through this, she was given the opportunity to conduct an interview with Araki for an episode aptly titled, I Want to Receive the World's Best JoJo's Bizarre Lessons and I guess who better to get them from than the series creator. This segment is very well known for being fairly cringy, but in kind of a funny way. While the main interview itself is pretty standard and gives some great insight into how a Rocky works, Shoko is fangirling on the side the entire time. Which, you know, to be fair, I probably would too. She arrives at Araki's office cosplaying as Jotaro Kujo and goes on multiple rants about wanting to marry him. She even interjects this into the segment itself, asking Araki himself what he would think her and Jotaro's child would look like and what powers they would have. What I think is hilarious about this whole thing is that later, both her and Araki try their hands at drawing what they think this hypothetical child would look like, and Shoko's art is insanely detailed and well thought out, while Araki's version just kinda... just kinda looks like this. <laughs> Truly, Araki was always ahead of his time. 
Also, I didn't know how to naturally include this information from earlier, so I just figured I'd weasel it in at the end here. In 2014, Shoko released her own music cover of the anime's first opening, Sonochino Sadame. And unsurprisingly, it's an absolute bop. I really hope that Shoko gets the chance to make an official song for the anime in the future. She has an amazing vocal range. And no worries, just like usual, I'll link the interview and the song cover in the description below, so check them out if you're interested. All right, uh, now for something completely different. Boingo predicted 9-11. Yeah, we're going there. Now look, I know this might sound like a joke subject on the iceberg, but there is some merit to this. Allow me to elucidate ya. That, that's British for, uh, let me tell you. <laughs> Many fans have theorized that Araki, or more specifically, his character Boingo from Part 3, successfully predicted the 9-11 terrorist attacks on the Twin Towers. During the events of Stardust Crusaders in Chapter 189 of the manga, we are first introduced to the character of Boingo reading what appears to be just a random book. It's not too long until we discover that this seemingly normal object that is in Boingo's hand is actually just his stand, Toth which takes the form of an average everyday manga. It's shown to be titled The Oingo Boingo Brothers Adventure, and its ability is that it can predict the future via artistic depictions that materialize from within it. Boingo audibly notes that he has no control over what is shown in the manga, nor that he can stop it from happening whatsoever. Once it's present within the pages of the comic, it is destined to happen, no matter what. The reason that any of this is relevant at all is that during his introduction, Boingo encounters an up-and-coming manga artist wearing a shirt that has the numbers 911 printed on the front. This man then swipes Toth away from Boingo out of curiosity, only to find his own death depicted in the pages within. The panel showing the event even includes a plane flying in the background as well. This original story was first published all the way back in October 1st of 1990, a total of 11 years before the attacks on the World Trade Center. Numerous people have pointed to this seemingly random pairing of numbers and imagery with death as a sort of premonition of the future. And I can kind of see where they're coming from here. I mean, it definitely is a very strange coincidence that Araki chose that specific combination of numbers to put on a random character design. This subject was actually brought up in the interview that Shoko had with Araki, which I talked about earlier on the iceberg. During the interview, Shoko directly asks him about the coincidence and if it could be something maybe more. This is what he had to say. Quite recently, I was told that there was a predictive scene in JoJo. It was surprising then. I don't really get why I drew such a thing, but I think it was just a coincidence. In the interview, Shoko had asked if he had drawn the scene intentionally, or if it had meant anything specific at the time. He responded by saying, Well, I don't know. I don't remember. I drew that scene as a part of the story, but I don't know what it means. Very strange way of putting that, Rocky. Something I want to further note on this before moving on is that when it came for the anime to adapt this scene in particular, the design of the artist was changed to remove the numbers from his shirt. The panel shown in the manga was also altered. Araki forgot. This was once a common phrase repeated throughout the JoJo fan community in direct response to the many strange inconsistencies present throughout the series, or at least what people gleamed as inconsistencies. There's a lot of back and forth on if various aspects of JoJo are the result of Araki forgetting information about his own story or readers misinterpreting his work. For example, Kakyoin's supposed painting-based ability. Early on in Part 3, Kakyoin is introduced with what appears to be a stand ability based around art and painting. However, after his introduction, this theming is never used again. Because of this, many consider it a dropped idea, or one that was straight up forgotten by Araki over time. However, others argue that it was simply used as a sort of disguise to make him look less conspicuous, or a blatant narrative misdirect to generate more intrigue by readers. 
Likewise, I've seen many argue that Araki forgot about Joseph's Hermit Purple abilities in Diamond is Unbreakable in relation to Kira. Much of the series' Western readers and viewers believe that Hermit Purple could use its divination abilities to locate Kira's location after fleeing and changing his identity. While the logic behind this seems sound, Joseph never actually does this in the story at all, leading to a lot of fan outcry as to why this was never even attempted. Still though, I've seen plenty of clear evidence against this argument, much like the Kakyoin one. You see, Joseph was originally brought into the plot of Part 4 to locate the stand user of Akira Otoishi. And unlike what you might assume based on what we've just talked about, he wasn't brought to Japan to use his spirit photography to aid in the search. He was actually brought there to just use his Hermit Purple to search the power lines throughout Morio. This much is stated by Jotaro outright, since Akira's stand, Red Hot Chili Peppers, had been using the lines to travel throughout the town. There's even other evidence that suggests that Hermit Purple's spirit photography and divination isn't exactly as accurate or explicit as we might think, either. In Part 3, its use was very limited due to this inaccuracy. The only reason that they could even locate Dio in Egypt wasn't because of Hermit Purple specifically, but due to a set of very extremely specific circumstances. All that Hermit Purple could do with its base set of abilities was capture a vague photo of Dio in very poor lighting. It was Jotaro who was able to trace the photo's origins with Star Platinum, pointing out and sketching a very minor detail that no one else was able to notice, a small fly present within the photo. This same limitation is present later on as well. Joseph notes that himself, Jotaro, and Dio are all connected by the same bloodline, through the fact that Dio is connected to Jonathan's body. This is why Dio is aware of their whereabouts just like they are, and is able to send enemy stand users after them so consistently. In an attempt to use this connection against him, Joseph connects Hermit Purple to a television to possibly get more information about Dio and their upcoming journey. Hermit Purple then divines the information that there is a traitor among the group. However, this isn't exactly the case. The traitor that the TV is talking about is actually the enemy stand user Rubber Soul, who is using his stand Yellow Temperance to disguise himself as Kakyoin. So it's less of a traitor among them and more of an imposter. <laughs> The information that's given from Hermit Purple is, again, slightly vague and inaccurate. This trend actually continues into the beginning of Part 4, where Joseph tries to get a spirit photo of Josuke to assist in Jotaro finding him, and instead gets a photo of the infamous serial killer Angelo and his stand Aqua Necklace. These two tidbits about Kakyoin and Joseph aren't the only of their kind, just popular examples of Araki Forgot that have been deconfirmed over time. And to this day, both sides of these situations in the fanbase have their explanations for and against why Araki forgot information about JoJo's, which in turn eventually culminated in the simple phrase of Araki forgot being echoed throughout the English-speaking community whenever a possible inconsistency is then discovered. One thing that I don't see many people comment on, however, is that Araki himself has talked about this before. In one interesting interview, he stated how upon going back and rereading his older parts, he barely remembered remembered any of the plot details or characters throughout. All of this is not to say that this sort of thing could ever make Araki a bad writer, far from it. I just found that an interesting detail. Being a good writer doesn't necessarily stem from memory, it stems from creativity. And even if Araki were to have poor memory, I feel like it wouldn't detract from his work as many people would make it seem. Now I know that some people have probably gotten a bit pissed off at me for even including this subject in the video, but regardless of all of that, I think it deserves a bit of spotlight. Given the phrase's significance in the community. There are plenty of videos online that go further into proving or disproving this point. So if you want to argue, uh, go do it with them, not me. You know me, I'm just a little baby. I don't know nothing. Don't get mad at a little baby. Okay, so warning, the next subject on the iceberg has massive spoilers for the latter half of part six, Stone Ocean. If you don't want to be spoiled, I'd suggest skipping to the timestamps shown on screen right now. 
Again, if you don't want to be spoiled on the ending of part six, Stone Ocean, skip forward right now. Okay, we good? Fantastic. Anyway, Jotaro dies in part six. Given that Jotaro is practically the face of the entire series, this has become one of the biggest spoilers in the entirety of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. And because of this, a lot of assholes on the internet enjoy spamming this spoiler all over YouTube and social media. Odds are, you've probably seen some dipshit post about this blatantly online whenever a new anime adaptation is announced or a new fan talks about getting into the series. I'm pretty sure that I was even spoiled on this before getting around to reading part 6. But thankfully, I have the memory of a walnut, so I forgot about it when I was reading. However, I don't want to just talk about the fact that it's a spoiler, I want to talk about the actual death scene in particular because it's really intriguing upon further analysis. In a last-ditch effort to save Jolene from Maid in Heaven during the climax of Part 6, Jotaro receives a fatal blow that seemingly splits open his head. But this isn't the first time we've seen this sucker bust open like this. And by sucker, I mean his head. I don't know, I don't know why I wrote it in the script like that. Uh, just, just his head. This isn't the first time that we've seen his head bust open. Several years earlier, during the storyline of Stardust Crusaders, the Oingo Boingo brothers were attempting to kill Jotaro. And from within the pages of Boingo Stand Toth, which I remind you can predict the future, we can clearly see Jotaro looking similarly to his final moments in Stone Ocean. Of course, in the original arc, this page is actually just a setup to a joke where Oingo disguises himself as Jotaro and gets his shit wrecked in a similar fashion. Several fans have pointed out that this could be a double red herring and that Araki had always planned on killing off Jotaro in this specific way. Now that is some big brain foreshadowing if that is the case. Obviously, you could always try to disprove this theory by pointing out that the split isn't in the exact same position on both separate occasions, but it's been shown that the events depicted in Toth's pages don't always match up exactly with what actually happens. They're more like a depiction of a given event rather than an exact showcase. If you want to go farther with this too, this same sort of head split occurs during the events of Diamond is Unbreakable, when Jotaro is originally killed by Bites the Dust. With that in mind, I feel like it's more than a coincidence that every time Jotaro's death is portrayed in the series, his head is torn in half. I don't know, man. It's just way too specific to me. And I actually really like the theory that this was always Araki's intention. A lot of people might joke that Araki can't remember things, but if this stuff was intended, this is some genius level commitment. Purple Haze Feedback this was a Japanese light novel written by Kohei Kodono, featuring various illustrations by the big banana himself, Hirohiko Araki. Its story takes place six months after the events of Part 5 Golden Wind, and follows a plot that primarily focuses on Panicata Fugo. Yeah, you heard me right, the very same Fugo that got shafted midway through the main story insanely hard. Personally, I don't really know that much about this entry myself because I haven't devoted the time to read it on my own, but I do know how much of a big deal this book is to the fanbase overall. After Fugo had left the group in Part 5, many expected him to return in some way or make a surprise comeback near the end, but uh, no, he never returns and is never given a satisfying ending to his character. And I think that pretty much every fan of this series can mutually agree that this was super disappointing. There's an entry later down in this iceberg that talks a bit more about this strangely unattended plot thread, so I'll talk more about specifics on this later. But the major thing that you need to know here is that people were kind of upset that Fugo never got a proper time to shine. He was really only featured in one major fight, and even then he was in it in a very limited sense. So if you were a fan of Fugo for any reason, um, good luck buddy, there's really not much to do there. Although thankfully, that is where this book comes in. It's a full story that focuses on Fugo as the main character, and better fleshes him out in ways that the main series was never able to. And it's for that very reason that so many people are big fans of it. Not only does it help to better tie up loose ends from part 5, but I've also heard that it's a genuinely great story with interesting fights and dynamics. But despite all of that, it's canonistic to the main JoJo series is negligible at best. Its ties to the main series are difficult 
to kind of understand. Some aspects of the plot have been referenced in some of the video game material, like in All-Star Battle, though there's also been a lot of evidence to the contrary that it's actually not connected at all. But to get into that, I have to specifically talk about the anime. You see, when it comes to the anime adaptation, the series has been known to add in or change existing scenes in an effort to fine-tune the older material and fix various plot details for consistency's sake. Like for example, in the anime adaptation of part three, everybody gets together and poses for this picture. In the anime, it's built up as this big sentimental thing, and Jotaro even looks at it on the plane at the end of the part. But in the original manga of part three, this picture is never taken and doesn't exist. The first time that it was ever shown on the page in any sort of sense in the original manga was actually part five. It was a really small and innocuous addition, but it was really cool that they went back in the anime and actually made it a scene in the show. No. Seeing that picture in part 5 is a lot more sentimental and awesome now that there's an actual story behind it. We got to actually sit there and see them take the picture. That was really cool. Overall, the fan response to these changes has been mostly positive, but with the airing of the Part 5 anime, longtime fans were treated with one change that threw Purple Haze Feedback's canonicity further into question. In episode 12 of the show, fans were exposed to an entirely new anime-only segment covering Fugo's backstory to give a better understanding of his character in the current arc. While this was a surprise to be sure and normally would be welcomed with open arms, it also contained some details that were a bit different than what some fans were expecting. This anime exclusive origin was actually written by Hirohiko Araki himself, which is actually really interesting to note given that most of the time his involvement with the anime's production up to that point had mostly just been surface level. He had never actively participated in producing story beats in such an in-depth way like this prior. And while the anime and manga are clearly separate entities, due to Araki's personal hand in it, many people have concluded that this origin could be canon to the manga as as well. The sad part about this being that this scene not only conflicts with the information present about Fugo's character in Feedback, but it also eradicated all fan speculation of David Productions potentially creating a Purple Haze Feedback OVA. What's even more peculiar about this is that David Productions actually asked Araki about including Fugo's backstory from the original novel to kind of tie things together. But for whatever reason, he actually decided to go against against that idea, instead just opting for a wholly new original origin story. Despite that, however, an adaptation of feedback could still be a possibility, though I've been told that they would have to make some really big changes to the novel's story in order to make it work. But I am going to be crossing my fingers on that though. Based on what I've seen about it, it seems like it would be a really cool epilogue to part 5. Pizza Mozzarella this is a song written and sung by Gyro Zeppoli during the events of Part 7 Steel Ball Run. The scene it originates from is a fan favorite, sparking the creation of various fan dubs, animations, and memes. One of my favorites of these is actually an anime accurate recreation of the scene by YouTube user Rawa's FHK. At the time of this video, Part 7 has yet to receive an anime, but through the use of official audio from the Eyes of Heaven video game and top-notch art, Rawa's FHK delivers a great adaptation of what this scene could eventually look like in animated form. Deadly Queen Okay, so to properly talk about this, I need to give some context. One of the biggest issues that JoJo has always had to face when being localized overseas is its use of musical references. I've talked about this a bit in a previous video, but I'll gladly go over it again for people who might not be aware. I'm sure it's fairly obvious to many fans at this point, but uh, shocker, Hirohiko Araki loves music. In specific, Western music, and references it all the time in his work. Though, unlike many other artists and authors, his references are much more direct, I guess you could say. Many of the characters and stands throughout the series are given the exact same names of pre-existing songs, musical artists, and bands that Araki is a fan of. Some examples of these include Robert E.O. Speedwagon being named after the band R.E.O. Speedwagon, Akira Otoishi stand Red Hot Chili Peppers being named after the band, well, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Giorno Giovanna stand Gold Experience being named after the Prince album The Golden Experience. This naming scheme has become a popular staple in JoJo and one that I really enjoy. 
I know that it's kind of cringy, but I've actually found a lot of my favorite bands and songs through this series alone. Araki just has some really good taste in music, I gotta say. Though as fun as this all is, uh, it does actually present a problem. Japan's copyright system is a little bit different than the one present in the United States. While these direct references may fly over there, they definitely do not in the so-called land of the free. Many people have speculated that it's due to this very reason that the series took so long to make its way to the West at all. And it's because of this that the current license holders of the property have altered many of the names in the series to avoid potential legal action. These new copyright-free names have been memed to death in the series fanbase, and with good reason. These new names are similar to the old ones, but just kind of off, or in some cases are just kind of batshit insane. While some of the name changes are pretty innocuous, like Black Sabbath changing to Shadow Sabbath, some names were completely butchered beyond repair, making them sound a thousand times goofier than they ever did prior. This leads us all the way back to the entry on the iceberg that brought us here. One of my favorite characters in all of JoJo is Yoshikage Kira. Being the main antagonist of Part 4, Kira is terrifying, and his stand, Killer Queen, is a reflection of that terror. The stand is a direct reference to the song of the same name, sung by Freddie Mercury, and I may be biased, but I think it has one of the coolest names in the entire series. Of course, given its origins, English translators had to change it overseas. And change it they did, as Killer Queen became... Deadly... Queen. This new name was coined all the way back when All-Star Battle the video game came over to the West, but its usage became much more well known in the official English dub of Part 4's anime by Viz Media. Prior to the dub, many of these name changes were pretty easily ignored by most of the fanbase. When watching the show subtitled, it was pretty easy to mentally bypass some of the names being different in the translation. Like, you could still hear the Japanese voice actors saying the original names, so for the most part, it was easy to ignore. Sadly, the English dub doesn't have the same luxury, as voice actors need to use the new names. So, when Part 4's anime dub was first being broadcast, many fans fans were introduced to Deadly Queen for the first time. While many viewers enjoyed Kira's English dub performance, myself included, the actor's use of the name Deadly Queen was hilarious to pretty much everybody. Much like a lot of the stuff on this iceberg, this led to many, many memes. Star Platinum is Jonathan. This is a fan theory that I've seen tossed around online for years now, even way back when I first got into JoJo during high school. The theory states that Star Platinum is actually the spirit of Jonathan Joestar from Part 1, with people pointing out in a few different directions on why this could be the case. Some people have noticed some visual similarities that link the two together, while others have commented on how this would make sense story-wise, tying together Parts 1 through 3 with a crossover of all of the JoJo's so far, and allowing Jonathan to finally defeat Dio after losing back in Part 1. While I personally don't buy into it, I think it's a really cool concept, and would have been super dope if it was confirmed to be true. There's been some great fan content and comics that showcase this twist in action, and they're all really cool. I just don't think it was ever Araki's direct intention, and if it was, it would probably open up a whole can of worms when it comes to the origins of stands and how they work. At the very least, I feel like some aspects of Star Platinum's design are supposed to reference Jonathan Joestar in some way. I just don't really think that there's a connection beyond that. Avdol is still alive. This entry could be in reference to two different things, so we're going to cover both of them uh, real quick. First, it could be referring to the twist where Avdol is still alive in Part 3 after being shot in the head by Whole Horse. Out of the two options, uh, this is the more obvious one that everybody already knows about, or, and this is the much more interesting option, this subject could be referring to the theory that Avdol is still alive after being disintegrated by the stand Crane. 
A few people have theorized that Cream might work the same way as Okuyasu's stand, the hand. Early on in part 4, Diamond is Unbreakable, Okuyasu admits that he doesn't know where things go that get erased by the hand. Either they get eviscerated, you know, deleted from existence, or maybe they just get teleported to someplace else throughout the universe. And if the latter is true and Cream and the hand are the same type of stand, then it's theoretically possible that Avdol isn't dead and instead just transported somewhere throughout the universe or even on Earth. Although something that people don't seem to really think about when they bring up this theory is that, you know, Avdol might be alive, uh, but I don't think that he has his arms anymore. His arms were ripped off right before he died, so he's just somewhere in the universe with no arms. Again, this is just a theory and it doesn't really make much sense because Polnareff saw Avdol's ghost after the cream fight, but who cares about that dude? Amputee Avdol is OP! Hey everyone, it's Salty here. Thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, if you're surprised as to why there's not more iceberg content to go around, uh, that's because there actually is, and I'm still working on it. I decided to split this project up into four distinct videos because of the fact that uh, it got really, really fucking long, as you can probably tell. I only went through three tiers and like a, a handful of subjects and it's already an hour and 30 minutes. I've been working on this project for around two to three years at this point, on and off, and I'm glad that it's finally starting to release. Uh, so if you want to see more of this and you want to support more, please I don't e-beg that much, but please subscribe. Uh, I don't normally do a lot of content like this, however, I do also have a review and retrospective of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 1 Phantom Blood that is up right now. It's an hour long, so that's another hour of JoJo content for you to check out if you like this one. Uh, I was really proud of that video too, and uh, yeah, I hope you guys stick around for the rest of the iceberg as it comes out. Uh, the current plan is to get out uh, Part 2 of this iceberg. Uh, within the month uh, hopefully, if not, uh, I'm gonna be actually going on break for like around January and February just to organize myself for the new year. Uh, and you know, then when I get back, I'll probably just drop the rest of it all in one like dump, all in one go, who knows? Uh, so yeah, if you want to see that and uh, support it and check it out, share the iceberg with your friends if you think that they would like it. Uh, this was a pain in the ass, but yeah, I won't, I'll stop rambling, sorry. Uh, thank you so much for watching, have a good one.